How I Live Now, Chapter 1 to 5. My name is Elizabeth, but no one's ever called me that. My father took one look at me when I was born and must have thought I had the face of someone dignified and sad like an old-fashioned queen or a dead person. But what I turned out like is plain, not that much there to notice. Even my life has been so far been plain, more daisy than Elizabeth from the world word go. But the summer I went to England to stay with my cousins changed everything. Part of that was because of the war, which supposedly changed lots of things, but I can't remember much about life before the war anyways, so it doesn't count in my book, which is this. Mostly, everything changed because of Edmund. So here's what happened. Chapter 2 I'm coming off this plane, and I'll tell you why that is later. I'm landing at London Airport, and I'm looking around for a middle-aged kind of woman who I've seen in pictures, my Aunt Penn. The photographs are out of date, but she looked like the type who would wear a big necklace and flat shoes, and maybe some kind of narrow dress in black or grey. But I'm just guessing, since the pictures only showed her face. Anyways, I'm looking and looking, and everyone's leaving, and there's no signal on my phone, and I'm thinking, oh great, I'm going to be abandoned at the airport, so that's two countries they don't want me in, when I notice everyone's gone except this kid who comes up to me and says, you must be Daisy. And when I look, relieved, he does too, and says, I'm Edmund. Hello, Edmund, I said. Nice to meet you. And I look at him hard to try and get a feel for what my new life with my new cousins will be like. Now, let me tell you what he looks like before I forget, because it's not exactly what you'd expect from your average 14 year old. What with the cigarette and the hair that looked like he'd cut it himself with a hatchet in the dead of night. But aside from that, he's exactly like some kind of mutt. You know, the ones you see at the dog shelter who are kind of hopeful and sweet and put their nose straight in your hand when you meet when they meet you with a certain kind of dignity and you know that from that second you're going to take him home well that's him only he took me home i'll get i'll take your bag he said even though he's about half a mile shorter than me and has arms about as thick as a dog leg he grabs my bag and i grab it back and say where's your mom is she in the car he smiles and takes a drag on a cigarette which even though i know smoking kills and all that i think is a little bit cool and maybe all the kids in england smoke cigarettes I don't say anything in case it's a well-known fact that the smoking age in England is something like 12. And by making a big thing about it, I'll end up looking like an idiot when I've barely been here five minutes. Anyway, he says, mom couldn't come to the airport because she's working and it's not worth anyone's life to interrupt her while she's working. And everyone else seemed to be somewhere else, so I drove here myself. I looked at him funny then. You drove here yourself? You drove here yourself? Yeah, well, and I'm the Duchess of Panama's private secretary. And then he gave a little shug and like a little dog sheltered dog kind of tilted his head and pointed at a falling apart black jeep and he opened the door by reaching in through the window, which was open, and pulling the handle up and yanking. He threw my bag in the back, the more like pushed it in because it was pretty heavy, and then said, get in, Cousin Daisy. And there was nothing else I could think to do, so I got in. I'm still trying to get my head around all this, when instead of following the signs that say exit, he turns the car up onto this grass and then drives across to a sign that says do not enter, and of course he enters, and then he jogs left across the ditch, and suddenly we're out on the highway. Can you believe they charge 13 and pounds and 50 pence just to park here for an hour, he says to me. Well, to be fair, there's no way I'm believing any of this, being driven along on the wrong side of the road by this skinny kid dragging on a cigarette, and let's face it, who wouldn't be thinking what a weird place England is? And then he looked at me again in his funny doggy way and said, you'll get used to it, which was strange too, because I hadn't said anything out loud. Chapter three. I fell asleep in the Jeep because it was a long way to get to their house and watching the highway go by always makes me want to close my eyes. And then I opened them again. There was this welcoming committee staring at me through the window and in it were four kids and a goat and a couple of dogs who I later was told were called Jet and Jin. And in the background, I saw some cats scooting around over a bunch of ducks that for some reason or other were hanging around on the lawn. For a minute, I was so glad I was 15 and from New York City because even though I hadn't actually seen it all, I have in fact seen more than plenty. And I have one of the best, oh yeah, this is so much what I usually do kind of faces of anyone in my crowd. I put on that face right then. Though, let's be fair, all of this was taking me pretty much by surprise because I didn't want them to think that kids from New York City are not at least as cool as English kids who just happen to live in a huge ancient houses and have goats and dogs and all the rest. There's still no Aunt Pen, but Edmund introduces me to the rest of my cousins who are called Isaac and Osbert and Piper, which I won't even begin to comment on. Isaac is Edmund's twin, and they look exactly the same, only Isaac's eyes are green, and Edmund's are the same color as the sky, which at the moment is gray. 
At first, I liked Piper best because she looked straight at me and said, we are very glad you've come, Elizabeth. Daisy, I corrected her, and she nodded in a solemn kind of way that made me feel sure she'd remember. Isaac started lugging my bag over to the house, and then Osborne, who's the oldest, uh, came and grabbed it away from him, looking superior, and disappeared into the house with it. Before I can tell you what happened then, I have to tell you about the house, which is practically indescribable if the only sort of houses you've lived in before are apartments in New York City. First, let's get it clear that the house is practically falling down, but for some reason, that doesn't seem to make any difference to how beautiful it is. It's made out of big chunks of yellowish stone, and has a steep roof, and is shaped like an L around a courtyard with fat pebbles set in the ground. The shortest part of the L has a wide arched doorway, and it used to be the stable. But now it's the kitchen, and it's huge, with zigzag brick floors and big windows all around the front, and a stable door that's left open whenever it's not actually snowing, says Edmund. Climbing up to the front of the house is a huge vine with a stem so thick, you must have seen it growing there for a hundred years, but there aren't any flowers on it yet, I guess because it's too early. Behind the house and up some stone steps is a square garden surrounded by high brick walls, and in there are tons of flowers blooming already, all in shades of white. In one corner, there's a stone angel about the size of a child, very worn, with folded wings, and Piper told me it was a child who lived in the house hundreds of years ago and is buried in the garden. Later, when I get a chance to look around the house, I find that the inside is much more jumbled up than the outside, with funny corridors that don't seem to lead anywhere, and tiny bedrooms with slanty ceilings hidden away at the top of the stairs. The stairs all creak and there are no curtains on any of the windows and all the main rooms seem huge after what I'm used to and they're scattered with big old comfortable furniture and paintings and books and huge fireplaces you can walk into and animals posing around the place to make it look even more authentic oldie worldy. The bathrooms turn out to be pretty oldie worldy too or maybe I should say antique and make a huge noise whenever you want to do anything private. Behind the house is tons of farmland some of which look just like meadows and some of which is planted, potatoes, and some of it is just starting to bloom in an acidy yellow color, which Edmund says is rape, as in rapeseed oil. But the only kind of rape I know is the kind you read about in a paper ten times a day and always ignore, unless the rapist turns out to be a priest or someone on TV. There's a farmer who comes and does all the planting, because Aunt Penn has, always has, important work to do related to the peace process, and anyways, wouldn't know the first thing about farming, according to Edmund. But the key sheep and goats and cats and dogs and chickens for decoration said osborne in a slightly sneery way and i'm getting the feeling about him that he's the one cousin who reminds me of people i knew in new york city edmund and piper and isaac and osborne and jet and gin the black and white dogs and a bunch of cats all went into the kitchen first and we sat down at a wooden table and someone made cups of tea then they all stared at me like I was something interesting they'd ordered from a zoo and asked me all lots of questions in a much more polite way than would ever happen in New York, where kids would pretty much wait for some grown-up to come in, all feet cheerful, and put cookies on a plate and make you say your names. After a while, I was feeling woozy and thought, boy, I could ever use a drink of freezing water to clear my head. When I looked up, Edmund was standing there holding one hand out, and in it was a glass of water with ice cubes, all the time looking at me with his almost smiling look. Though I didn't think much about it this time, I noticed Isaac looking at Edmund in a funny way. Then Osbert got up and left. He's 16 and the oldest, in any case, I didn't say it, which is a year older than me. Piper asked if I wanted to see the animals or just lie down for a while, and I said lie down because even before I left New York, I hadn't exactly been getting my fair share of sleep. She looked disappointed for a second, and really I was feeling so much more tired than polite that I hardly cared. She took me upstairs to a room down at the end of the hall, which was kind of a room a monk would live in, small and plain with thick white walls that weren't straight like new walls, and one huge window divided into lots of panes of yellow and greenish glass. There was a big striped cat under the bed and some daffodils in an old bottle, and suddenly that room seemed like the safest place I'd ever been in my life, which just goes to show how wrong a person can be about what's in store for them. But here I go, jumping the gun again. We pushed my suitcase into a corner and Piper came in with a big pile of old blankets and she said in a shy way that they were woven from the sheep on the farm a long time ago and that the black ones were from the black sheep. I pulled the black sheep blanket over my head and closed my eyes and for no good reason I could think of, I felt like I belonged to this house for centuries, but that could have been wishful thinking. And then I fell asleep. Chapter 4 I didn't mean to sleep practically a whole day and night, but I did. 
When I woke up, I thought how strange it was to be lying in someone else's bed, thousands of miles from home, surrounded by grayish light and a weird kind of quiet that you never get in New York City, where the traffic keeps you company in a constant buzzy way day and night. The first thing I did was to check my phone for messages, but all it said was no network. And I thought, oh boy, so much for civilization, and felt a little freaked out and thought that of that movie where they said no one can hear you scream. But then I went over to the window and looked out, and there was the slightest big bit of pink light over one side where the sun must have just started coming up. And a totally quiet gray mist hung over the barn and gardens and fields, and everything else was perfectly still and beautiful. And I stared and stared, expecting to see a deer, maybe a unicorn, trotting home after a hard night. But I didn't see anything except some birds. After a while, I was cold and got black back under the blankets. I felt too shy to come out of my room, so I stayed there and thought about my old home, which unfortunately led to thinking about Davina the Diabolical, who sucked my father's soul out through his you-know-what, and then got herself knocked up with the devil spawn, which, when it pops out, Leah and I are going to call Damien, even if it's a girl. According to my best friend Leah, D the D would have to like, would have liked to poison me slowly till I turned black and swelled up like a pig and died in agony. But I guess that plan flopped when I refused to eat anything, and in the end, she got me sent off to live with a bunch of cousins I'd never met a few thousand miles away, while she and Dad and the Devil Spawn went on their merry way. If she was making even the slightest attempt to address centuries of bad press for stepmothers, she scored a big fat zero. Before I could work myself up to a full-blown attack of hyperventilating, I heard a tiny noise at the door, and there was Piper again, looking in. And when she saw I was awake, she gave a happy little squeak like a mouse cheer, and asked, did I want a cup of tea? Okay, I said, and then thank you, remembering to be polite. And I smiled at her because I still liked her from yesterday. And off she drifted, just like the fog on little cat feet. I went to the window again and looked out and saw the mist had cleared and everything was so green. And then I put some clothes on and managed to find the kitchen after discovering some pretty amazing rooms by mistake. And Isaac and Edmund were there eating marmalade on toast, and Piper, Piper was making my tea and seeming worried that I'd have to get out of bed to get it. In New York, nine-year-olds usually don't do this sort of thing, but wait for some grown-up to do it for them. So I was impressed by her intrepid attitude, but also kind of wondering if good old Aunt Penn had died and no one could figure out a good way to tell me. Mum was working all night, said Edmund, so she's gone to bed, but she'll be up for lunch and then you'll see her. Well, that answered that. Thank you, Edmund. While I drank my tea, I could see Piper squirming around, wanting to tell me something, and she kept looking at Edmund and Isaac, who just looked back, and at last she said, please come to the barn, Daisy, and the please was more like a command than a request, and then she gave her brothers a look like I couldn't help it. But when I got up to go with her, she did the nicest thing, which was to hold my hand, and it made me want to hug her, especially since being nice to Daisy hasn't been anybody's favorite hobby lately. In the barn, which smelled like animals, but in a nice way, she showed me a tiny black and white goat with square eyes and little stubby horns and a bell around its neck on a red collar and said his name was Ding, and he was her goat, but I could have him if I wanted. And then I did hug her because Piper and the sweet baby goat were exactly as nice as each other. Then she showed me a bunch of sheep with long tingly coats and some chickens that laid blue eggs and that she found one in the straw that was still warm and gave it to me. And even though I didn't know what to do with an egg straight from a chicken's bottom, I thought it was a nice thing to do. I can't wait to tell Leah about this place. After a while, I was feeling pretty shivery and told Piper that I had to lie down for a little while, and she frowned at me and said, you need some to eat something because you look too thin. And I said, Christ, Piper, don't you start. It's only jet lag. And she looked hurt, but Jesus, that old broken record is one I don't need to hear from, to people, from people I hardly even know. When I got up again, there was soup and cheese and a huge loaf of bread in the kitchen, and Aunt Pen was there. And when she saw me, she came right up and put her arms around me and then stood back and looked me in the face and just said, Elizabeth, like it was the end of a sentence. Then after a while, you look just like your mother, which was obviously a gross exaggeration since she was beautiful and I'm not. Aunt Pen had the same eyes as Piper, all serious and watching you. And when we sat down to lunch... She didn't give me soup or anything, but just said, please, Daisy, help yourself to whatever you'd like. I told them all about Dad and Davina at the Diabolical and Damien the Devil Spawn, and they laughed, but you could tell they kind of felt sorry for me. And Aunt Penn said, well, their loss is our gain, which was nice, even if she was just being polite. I tried to study her without being too obvious because I was hoping to get some sort of clue from the way she acted and looked and acted about the mother I barely ever got a chance to meet. 
She made a point of asking me lots of questions about my life and listened very carefully to the answers, like she was trying to figure something out about me, but not in the way most adults do, pretending to listen while thinking about something else. She asked how my father was and said she hadn't seen him in many years, and I told her he was fine except for his taste in girlfriends, which was totally unfine, but he was probably feeling lots better now that I wasn't around reminding him about a day and night. She smiled a funny kind of smile just then, like she was trying to keep from laughing or maybe crying. And when I looked at her eyes, I could see she was on my side, which was, as far as I'm concerned, made a nice change. And I guess had something to do with my mother being her younger sister who died. There was a fair amount of arguing and talking at lunch, except for talking to me. She didn't get too involved, but kind of observed. And overall, I'd have to say that the main feeling you got from her was a little distracted, I suppose because of the work she was doing. A little later, when the others were talking, she put her hand on my arm and said in a low voice just to me that she wished my mother was here to see how I turned into such a vivid person. And I thought, vivid? That's a pretty strange word to use, to choose. And I wondered if she was actually meaning to say screwed up. But then again, maybe not, because she didn't seem like the type to sit around thinking of ways to be bitchy, unlike some people I know. After looking at me for a few seconds more, she put her hand up very gently and pushed the hair off my face in a way that for some reason made me feel incredibly sad. And then she said in a regretful, grave voice that she was sorry, but she had to give a lecture in Oslo at the end of the week on the imminent threat of war and had work to do. So would I please excuse her? She'd only be gone for a few days in Oslo and the children would take good care of me. And I thought, there's that old war again, popping up like a bad penny. I didn't spend much time thinking about the war because I was bored with everyone jabbering on about it for the last five years about would there be one or wouldn't there? And I happened to know there wasn't anything we could do about it anyway, so why even bring the subject up? It was when I was thinking things like this that I sometimes noticed Edmund looking at me in his odd listening kind of way, and sometimes I looked back at him, doing the same expression myself, just to see what he'd say. But mostly he just smiled and half closed his eyes and looked more like a wise dog than ever. And I thought to myself, if this kid turns out to be 35, I won't be a bit surprised. So that was pretty much all that happened on my first conscious day in England, and so far I was finding life with my cousins more than okay, and a huge improvement over my so-called life at home on 86th Street. Late that night, I heard the phone ring somewhere in the house, and I wondered if it was my father to calling say, hey, I made a mistake sending my only daughter away to another country because of some scheming, harpy, ruthless whims. But by that time, I was too sleepy to be bothering getting up and wandered around and wandering around looking for a keyhole to listen at. So as you can see, that old country air must be doing me tons of good already. Chapter 5 Early the next morning, I was strolling around as usual in my unpleasantly populated subconscious when I heard Emmons' voice very close to my ear saying, Daisy, wake up! And there was his face right near mine and a burning cigarette in one hand and some kind of striped Turkish slipper on his feet. And he said, come on, we're going fishing. And I forgot to say I hate fishing and fish too, now that you mention it. And instead pulled myself out from under my blankets and put on some clothes without washing or anything. And next thing I knew, Edmund and Isaac and Piper and I were sitting in the Jeep and bumping down a bumpy old road. And the sun was streaming in the windows and it felt much nicer than usual to be alive, even if it meant a bunch of fish were going to have to die. Edmund was driving with the rest of us crammed into the front seat, not wearing seat belts because there weren't any, and Piper singing a song I'd never heard before with a funny jagged melody, and her voice was as pure as an angel. We got to a place by a river and parked the jeep and got out, and Isaac carried all the fishing stuff, and Edmund brought lunch and a blanket to lie on, and although the day wasn't very warm, I made a nest for myself by trampling down a little patch in the tall grass and put the blanket down and lay very still, and as the sun rose up in the sky, I warmed up even more. And all I could hear was the sound of Edmund talking in a steady, low stream of conversation to the fish, and Piper singing her odd song, and the occasional splash of the river, or a bird rising into the air near us and singing its heart out. I was thinking about almost nothing except that bird, and then Edmund was next to my ear whispering Skylark, and I just nodded, knowing it was futile to ask how he knew the answers to questions you hadn't even got around to asking yet. Then he handed me a hot cup of tea from the thermos and disappeared again back to the fishing. No one caught much of anything except Piper, who caught a trout and threw it back. Piper always throws fish back, said Edmund, and Isaac said nothing as usual. I couldn't be happier as long as I didn't sit up there, because there was a coldish wind, so I lay there all dreamy and thought about Aunt Pen and my life so far, and got a little bit of a flashback of what it was like to be happy. 
It was times like this when I let my guard down for something like half a nanosecond that mom had a habit of strolling into my brain. Even though she was dead, which made people put on this sickening, pious kind of face and say, oh, I'm so sorry, like it was their fault. And in fact, if everyone wasn't so busy apologizing all the time about asking a perfectly normal question, like, where's your mother? I might have managed to get more information out of someone than just, she died to give you life, which is a party line on good old mom. It's a shame starting out your first day on the planet as a murderer, but there you go. I didn't have much choice at the time. Still, I could live quite happily without the labels I picked up because of it. Murderer or poor motherless lamb. Which one would you choose? The rock or the hard place? Dad was one of those never mention her name again types, which if you ask me was extremely unpsychologically correct of him. Leah's father worked on Wall Street and shot himself one day when he lost $600 million of someone else's money and they never shut up about him in their house, which, as Leah likes to point out, is not the perfect answer either. I sometimes wished someone would just fill me in on some simple boring things like, did she have big feet or wear makeup or what was her favorite song and did she like dogs or have a nice voice and what books did she read, etc. I made up my mind to ask Aunt Penn some of these questions when she came back from Oslo. But I guess what you really want to know are things you can't ask, like, did she have eyes like yours? And when you pushed my hair back, was that what it feels like to have your mother do it? And did her hands look serious and quiet like yours? And did she ever have a chance to look at me with a complicated expression like the one on your face? And by the way, was she scared to die? Then Edmund and Piper came and lay down on the blanket, one on either side of me, with Piper holding my hand as usual, and Isaac still standing in the water looking peaceful. Then they started arguing about what flies trout like best in a quiet, lazy sort of way, and Edmund blew smoke rings in the air, and I closed my eyes and wished they were mine.